You, you now make a point of, that's, a, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock we are forcing behaviors. 54% uh, of the incoming class are women. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, it's, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. And that's not just not recruiting, it is development, as Ken said. And ultimately, it's still going to take time, but I am just as much shocked as Ken is that we have not seen more opportunities. And we're going to have to force change. Well, there we have it, folks. That was Larry Fink, the chairman and CEO of BlackRock Investment Firm, basically coming right out and telling us exactly why the phenomena of go woke, go broke is persisting, despite the fact that these businesses, uh, you would think, are, are incentivized to produce a profit. Well, you know, I wanted to just come in and I actually wanted to ask you how you felt when you first heard this. You know, it was it confirmed something that I suspected for a long time, which is, you know, there's there's uh, plenty of content creators that are out there showing you Fortune 500 companies and the composition of, of who owns the most stock in, in, in the company. And overwhelmingly, it is BlackRock and Vanguard over and over and over again. So when I heard him saying this, it, it just confirmed what, what I thought before in that there's this kind of general trope out there in the conservative truther conspiracy freedom world of, of the internet that's saying, oh, go woke, go broke. Like these, these CEOs are all so stupid and disconnected from reality that they don't realize that these antics that they're pulling are going to hurt their bottom line. Uh, I knew that there was something deeper going on there. There's a reason why. You know, it's really interesting. Would it, I would even create a parallel between the civil rights movement and the funding, you know, who funded those things, you know, because obviously on the surface level, it seems that they're participating in this kind of childish game uh, and trying to sway and influence the masses. And the masses are like, well, it's not working. See, it didn't work, you know, like a trial and error. But but really what what to me it seems like is is that they're testing their ability to supply and demand the needs of the public. And if they can control those, let's say, needs, I think this is why he means, and he's talking the way that he is, with referring to forcing uh, people to have new needs, force change. And that really only happens if you have a complete... Uh, change in perception of what you think your needs actually are. So then it becomes a question of like, well, it, you know, well, these companies aren't so innocent anymore, are they? You know, there, there's obviously not just a monetary interest, but uh, potentially other agendas that are going to brew more needs, more artificial things that they're probably going to be the only ones to be able to give us those needs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 30 years ago, if you were to talk to what would consider widely to be the top business guy in the world, you wouldn't hear him talking about these things because the, the principles of inclusivity over meritocracy, essentially, where, where the most qualified guy for the job qualified guy for the job is, is passed over because of some either racial or gender or transgender quota that must be met. It is so blatantly and fundamentally contradictory to running a solid operating business. And, and it goes to show what something that we mentioned in the last podcast and that these giant corporations no longer have to respond to the market the same way that 
small businesses like ourselves do. If we decided to start hiring people purely based on superficial qualities of skin color and or gender or uh, sexual orientation, the business would be underground overnight. It's like it's very it's very important to have qualified people doing the job. So uh, it, it just goes to show what they call late stage capitalism is not really capitalism at all. It's it's really yeah. just fascism. It's a, 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 what I consider, I guess, capitalism is because there is an interest there that essentially at the end of that interest benefits everyone. Uh, but when those when when those interests become uh, multiplying desires that wear out those interests interests, excuse me, then we start to find ourselves in a place where there's way too much of everything, and we know that we don't need it yet. We're still there and accepting these things. You know, a lot of these companies all started off as IPOs. They all started as companies that essentially were from nothing. And at some point, you know, they're pretty square companies in that they had a proof of concept and an actual model that worked in real life. And back then you could go to an investor and they'd look at those things and they'd say, we're in business. Uh, But because of how cheap money is, thanks to the federal government, a lot of these asset management companies uh, throw money. And in the direction in which uh, there is no sound money, but there is sound branding. So there is a legitimate misconstruction mentally as to what is an ideal business investment move. And I see it all the time. And and we look at a lot of what happened in the, you know, just recently, a lot of the banks closing in, in Silicon Valley. Why is that? It's because there's so many people that are greedy we're not bringing it down to ourselves making that decision. It's like, oh, also the investor wants to have that greed. He wants to make sure that he gets a return. And these people are so with this same interest that they're willing to lie about their projections. And then the loan that they get, right? It's like, then here's another piece of that element. They get this loan and the loan isn't, it isn't built out to, of their current model. It's built out into some future, some 10x future that doesn't exist. And then we're left with this enormous warehouse space, all these lawyers, all of these employees, and this giant hole of a mess uh, that really isn't efficient. All we've done is we've kind of puffed up this brand and we've made this corporation from the start. Uh, maybe it was a genuine idea. Maybe there's some proprietary stuff. But what happens is a lot of the big time investment companies come in and they kind of either they take the idea of the person building the company or you just get ruled out. They'll build another company that's just like it and, and move on. That's just how it goes. To be in competition is is not a thing for them. You, you are either with them or not with them at this point. Yes. Uh, and a great example of what you just described is uh, just recently in the last couple of days, the syndicate investment firm that owns Pyrex and the, the Instant Pot brand, they, they, they molded all, they bought out the brands individually, molded them all together, did exactly what you just said. They had, they had this extremely profitable item called the instant pot the the pressure cooker thing that that's was fairly popular for a while there along with a very established brand of pyrex and they got bought out by this investment firm did exactly what you said took on massive amounts of debt in the form of loans based on futures projections immediately took a majority of that to pay out their stockholders and because of that it was doomed from the start but now we're seeing that there's an incentive in the market to incentivize this kind of behavior and it goes back to the what you could call like the alchemical foundation of the corporation, where there is this, this inhuman kind of cold calculated separation of, of boots on the ground to commercial uh, implications in the market. And, and people are doing this over and over and over. I, I, think, I think this is what's happened, man. And this is really, just, just came, it just came to me now because I'm, I'm thinking about liabilities and how liability came into existence in, in, through ships, right? And at some point, you know, you create your ship and I'll call it Vanguard. I'll call it whatever corporation, right? And I said to say, after a while, after a certain amount of times, you realize that 
liability is almost inevitable and those ships fall. And so I think that at some point, these people that have been, you know, conducting in merchant law for so long, uh, understand that really the game isn't, hey, what do I create? What's the new thing? It's uh, what is the system that allows for any of that to even happen, to take place or not take place? And I think that they're in this, this, you know, they're at the cusp of basically monopolizing everything. They own almost everything. Come And not just, you know, we're talking military defense, uh, makeup brands, detergent, every little thing you possibly think of, they're everywhere. And it's not so much for, uh, yeah, we are, we're here to build our, our client's investment portfolios. I keep hearing Fink, you know, he's like, we just want to satisfy our clients, which really is, is a delegation for, we just want to feed this hungry, uncontrollable person that really has infinite amount of desires and infinite amount of, of needs. And we're just going to blame it on him, on the consumer, that we're going to take on all this debt because we need, you know, a, a thousand uh, Costco's and we need all these different types of brands uh, because our customer will be sad. And so as long as the, the consumer is sedated with a promise uh, and that promise being a fulfillment of a false desire of themselves. And of course, this all comes down to how we identify ourselves. But on a surface level, it's like most of us are just thinking we're going to work. By the time we know it, we're invested. You know, we're so into, you know, not only our, our, uh, our work, but next thing you know, our 401k, we're connected to these companies. And we have to hear it. It's like, I don't even want to be part of it, but because there's so many people affected by it, it's like, now I have to take a look at it. What's wrong with this? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that today you could argue between the power that BlackRock and Vanguard have that the robber barons of the, the late 19th and early 20th century where, you know, the Rockefeller or whatever the Aston family would, would come in, Astor family would come in and just basically own an entire city and set up its own, its own little uh, sweatshops, its own manufacturing, its own grocery stores, all of that. It's, it's, it's a, an even more widespread and powerful version of that. It's just, it's very, very neatly hidden behind layers of corporate structures. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what what monarchies exist as today, which is employees. You know, they're really it's, they have their titles and roles, but really it's it's forms of employment with very strict uh, definitions of what we do as a whole. And it's like we all have to do what Larry Fink says because he really carries our greatest interest. All of all of our money is in his hands. Yeah. And it, it's, it was, I mean, very cold and calculated the way he just kind of like casually says, you know, if you don't, if you don't do this, you're going to feel that like you're, you're, you're going to take a hit, you know, uh, basically just telling you straight out, we have the power to influence your behavior. And they even, they even go on to say that, you know, governments don't have the power to basically force behaviors and, and cross over human rights, but the private side can do certain things like that. And so it's, it's this kind of, it's very obvious. It's a form of fascism. It's corporatocracy yeah. that, that is using the state agency to basically insulate itself against the, the oppression that it's putting on people. Yeah. They arm, they arm themselves with politicians, with legislation and people buy into it. You know, I can't even imagine I can't even recall the amount of times I've seen, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, gay pride stuff associated with JP Morgan and BlackRock. And yet, you know, what the, the companies that they hold and everything is completely 100 percent opposite how they're not being held against their, you know, marketing crimes. I don't know. But there is a threshold of, let's say, uh, a statute of limitations. Because at one point they'll be like, well, you know, we really care about this green movement, you know, and I call it greenwashing because it's just like we're, we need, we need to put everything into we recycling and we're doing everything that we can. Yet he's the largest stakeholder in a Chevron and, and huge gas companies. 
but he's the one that's supposed to change all of these things. And, but, you know, we were being sold on hope constantly. We're being sold on a promise that is never fulfilled. And they're laughing at us and they're legitimately telling us, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And we're still going to laugh at you. And it, it goes, it goes to show that um, almost how, because I'm not going to go feed into that they have control over this power, but really they have supreme delusion as to what they think the human being is, at least what they're treating the human being is. You know, like I, I that's why I don't associate with their way of managing investments. It's like I, I know he is an investment manager, so I know there is a there is an interest there to to increase profit and all of that, but you're not going to tell me that there's not one investment manager out there in the world. That's like, um, yes, my client wants, you know, 7% return. Uh, but he also doesn't want, you know, 50 blue whales killed, but that's kind of the trade off in terms of doing business. And in that when you're coming in and doing IPOs, and it's just an example, because again, the, the way that we do business has changed. Um, I forgot this was Grubhub or one of these, you know, Uber type of food delivery services went into IPO, right? And I remember wanting to be a business fan growing up and saying, I can't wait to open up my business and all this stuff and you'd have to be successful. This company never made a dollar and yet they were going public. They never made a dollar in profit, yet they were going public. How is this possible? The only way is if you get a bunch of people and a bunch of young guys at that who have all this drive, all this energy, and you promise them all this stuff. And on the, on the back end, you have investors who actually have been in the game. And they're like, oh, we've already been to you know, all these crash cycles. And we, we, we're, we're ready for these things because when these things happen, they're the only ones left with any assets. They don't even need any cash. But for everybody else, you know, we're being served a uh, a false platter. We're saying, here's, you know, here's everything that you need. And it's just absolutely not the case. They're, they're creating artificial needs constantly for us to feel like we depend on them, especially and if it's not obvious now, you know, their attempt to do so is frightening. But I think that we also underestimate our own ability to be resourceful. Exactly. And we always say over and over again, that our ignorance and complacency complacency is the actual currency that is purchasing this current madness, right? And our own experience and, and the people that we see and we work with in our corner of the internet, you could say, is very, it's very hopeful and inspiring because there are a new wavelength of people that are understanding these deep fundamental issues, taking deep personal responsibility and accountability and taking action to build something better. And so that bodes well for our future. You know, I, I, again, what would it look like if we didn't have anything like BlackRock? Well, I think that our needs would still be met. You know, of course they would still be met. It's just it wouldn't be so aggravated and hyperbolic. You know, I mean, uh, in the, the span of the existence of the toilet paper, how, how much has it advanced? And how many more brands of toilet paper? And like, let's just think about one section, one product, you know, toilets. And, and these things, but everyone is expected to live like a rich man. You know, the air conditioner was exclusively built for a rich man and now everybody has it thanks to, you know, capitalism and the need for the free market to work things out on its own. At a certain point, we have to discriminate, you know, the balances between these things. And I don't think any one person wants to take responsibility for the whole nation's resources. And I, I, I doubt that Larry Fink is going to be that person who's like, I'm going to take responsibility for the United States resources. He doesn't care. Oh, he's a globalist. All he cares about is where are the resources? Let me monopolize those resources because people can't think for themselves because I'm the smartest person in the world. So how about here's your choices and then all the rest of us, you know, elites are going to sit back and watch you play your little game. Mm hmm. Yeah. So uh, in, the, in the interest of, of kind of putting a bow on this whole issue, the, the inspiration behind this episode is 
the trope that's constantly being spread around in conservative media right now that the go woke, go broke. And people just throw that out there as if that somehow explains anything. And it's such a kind of a childish way of, of boiling all of this down. So what I wanted to do is share this perspective in that, you know, the target debacle is a big one recently with their inverted satanic clothing uh, line that they, that they made uh, and, and published recently big backlash, everybody's saying, oh, go woke, go broke. Well, when you look at who owns the majority of stock, it is Vanguard and BlackRock. And for those that don't know, BlackRock and Vanguard are basically two arms of the exact same entity. The The board of BlackRock is invested in, in Vanguard and vice versa. So they are, they're really just a black and white version of each other. And so they're, they're, the next two things I wanted to bring to people's attention is, first of all, it's this really interesting symbolism involved with a giant black rock that is spurring the evolution of the barbarian monkey race on uh, 2000 A Space Odyssey, yeah. the uh, famous film by, I forget, I forget his name off the top of my head. Um, uh, it'll, it'll come to me, but Ooh, I'm blinking too. I'm blinking too. Yeah. Um, there, this giant black monolith shows up and it causes the, the monkeys to first pick up their first weapon and start beating each other to death with the weapon. And eventually the weapon turns into a, a spaceship and, and they, they end up out in outer space being guided by this AI. And uh, I think that that's a, a very interesting symbol. And then the, the second part, because BlackRock and Vanguard being married, that I thought was very interesting is that Vanguard, the, the word itself is defined as the foremost position in an army or fleet advancing into battle. So that's, that's very, very interesting to me that, you know, you have the black rock, which is this ominous spawner slash slash steerer of human evolution. Yeah. And then the foremost position or fleet advancing into battle. Maybe that explains a little bit more, uh, comprehensively the, the go woke, go broke phenomena rather than just, Oh, I'm so much smarter than these woke CEOs and and they're dumb and they don't realize how to do business. Yeah. You know, to me, Vanguard is, is like, they've realized, you know, when you go into battle, there's death. So they hang back, you know, at some point the King was, was also the Vanguard, but then at some point it changed and the King sat back. And so, you know, it's like they're setting sail, you know, to these corporations and not all of them are going to make it. They don't know. They don't know for sure. They don't know. They're just like, all right, let's do all these things. And so, you know, in the light of doing a little bit of BlackRock research and all that stuff, I I started to see some parallels from, you know, government spending and also how wealthy BlackRock got. So I started to look at some stats from Statistica and the census and I started to see that the exact time and, you know, Vanguard, again, they manage public companies, right? IPOs, and then they are set off. So people don't realize that f- before COVID happened, there was like 400 IPOs in the year 2019. Before that, 248. And every year before that, for 10 years, was about give or take 50 you know, give or take, you know, meaning 150 or 200, you know, we're in that range. And then the year that COVID hit, we were in the thousands. And now why that doesn't make any sense almost other than that. Right before this all happened, legislators, everybody knew, oh, we're going to have a nice little big bill. We're going to have a nice chunk of cash. This bank, this bank, they're all ready to receive. Like how else is how else is this going to happen other than that people? You think when they're making like right now the Congress the Congress the yeah Congress has a uh, has a budget of one point seven trillion dollars. You think who do you think is the first ones in line that care about that bill, right? And so I started to see that you know the distribution in which the wealth of of the government is going into defense companies and you know guess what also these management uh, banking companies. So what I started to see is that I think I knew that all of, a lot of the major corporations knew or were told ahead of time. You know, these people in council foreign relation, people in a trilateral commission, 
people in these very high level boards, they were told this is what's going to happen with COVID. Whatever COVID is, who cares? They don't care if it's real or not. All that matters is the money. So when they were told that there's this thing, there's this condition of, you know, economic war and disease, we're going to take this opportunity and create a very special bill for all of us so we can get ourselves out of this situation and basically prolong everything that had to be dealt with. And the first one were, that were in line were all these companies that were essentially bailed out by the government. And the government just says, well, and that's why we see, you know, this, this corporate, uh, what was the word? Uh, you mentioned the word corporatocracy. Mm-hmm. And that's how it slowly happens. It's this, this merging of, of uh, legislation and corporations and, and their intents. But seeing this, I started to understand a little bit further that there's always people before anything happens on a big scale, very small groups of very wealthy people know exactly what's going to happen. Isn't that interesting? And I don't think that's because of coincidence. I think that it's because they have an influence of change and an influence of force, just like this gentleman is saying, except they've never, they've never been allowed to say these things. Right. Until now, we're so numbed out. We're just like, uh, maybe Fink can be the president of the world. He seems to know what he's doing with money. The, it's a, it's funny that you say that because when I was looking into BlackRock, uh, people were yeah. were spreading rumors that back in 2016, when Hillary Clinton was running, that she was going to ask him to be the vice president. And there's, so there's just and and all of the people that go from from government to regulations, uh, regulatory bodies inside of the government, and vice versa, back and forth. It's just it's so obvious at this point the the kind of slow grind towards fascism that has happened uh has has really reached a pinnacle in 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 a lot of ways but it's so sneaky it's so subtle that that most people don't realize that it's happening and and you know it's it's insane we you know we had we we were just having you know a couple years back hillary was in court being questioned by you know with her dealings with corrupt fbi uh, investigations dude our fbi was infiltrated and we're here not believing you know the things that could potentially happen with your 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 target who has a you know a franchise contract with starbucks you can be in there walk in drink your coffee all day long and and be hit with advertisements all day it's like they're they're it's it's much more intimately connected obviously we know there's monetary interest but just because they do a move that isn't in their financial interest doesn't mean that they're dumb or that they didn't they don't don't understand the, the savvies of, of public psychology. A true investor at that that level, they know exactly how psychology works. I would be willing to bet everything that in order for them to lose whatever number they lost is tick. It's a lead loss. They're gonna make five times that, ten times that amount of money because as soon as they get into and there's this, uh, you know, it's been said before. It, it's not once it becomes common, it's accepted as normal. And when it becomes it's normal, it becomes law. And and when we're talking about companies and private corporations, they're trying to nudge your desires. They're trying to influence what you think is real, what you can buy. Um, and they're, they have the biggest interest in you thinking that you can buy happiness, you can buy God, you can buy eternity, you can buy all of these things. Uh, but you can't but it's so uh, we want it we want it